it looks like we've got kind of a small group today and I'm not sure we've Doug and I when we originally contemplated this whole um, virtual leadership um, micro webinar series we decided to move it around to different times of the day so maybe this time isn't as good for some but we're certainly glad that you guys were able to join um, next slide Doug so today we're going to be talking about the leadership skills in virtual teams and um, as mentioned, I'm super happy to have uh, my friend, Dr. Doug Gray from Action Learning Associates joining us today with some great research that he's done. My name's Travis White. I'm the Director of Enterprise Sales for Degree. And you can ignore the stuff on the right. We're not going to mute you. Or if you have something that you would like to throw in, feel free. Um, generally, these calls have been running about 15 to 20 minutes, and we've got time to chat at the end. But we do have a smaller group today. So if you guys have an example or something that you've got a question about as we go, we'll be flexible to uh, entertain that. So without further ado, Doug. What color fish are you? <laughs> when I think about leadership competencies, it's, it's helpful to start with a definition. So I, I put in bold the definition. If I think about measurable characteristics that are related to your success at work, you all know that Travis is digitally savvy, he's bright, He's uh, entertaining. He's got a good sense of humor. Well, those are examples of competencies. They also can be behavioral, technical attributes, or they could be an attitude. So what we thought we'd do is to separate the red fish from the other colored fish is to give you three little categories. We're going to start with assessing your leadership competencies. Typically, this is what, are you, what is your team good at or what are you great at? And then creating some kind of a map or a competency model. It's a nerdy term, but it works really well. Why? So that you can apply it to your, to your team. So here's an example of assessment. And uh, this example is from DDI, uh, Development Dimensions International. But let's imagine that you've figured out that in your organization, you need to know how to drive, navigate, connect, relate, and think in these different ways. So for instance, you could have this column where people are, are ready uh, in that way. Or it could be, if you look at the key, that they're weak or they're strong in, in their readiness, their degree of readiness. And it could be that the impact on digital progress, this next column, is uh, more important in certain categories than others. So for instance, in this company, maybe you need to lead with digital, di digitization and determination is less important than adaptability. One of the things that I've noticed lately in my research is that there are two competencies that have really emerged in the, in the pandemic that uh, are critically important. Travis, any guesses? I think I, I think we may have discussed this as resilience, one of them. It often is, and I'll give you an example of that. Uh, I'll give it to you. So adaptability and collaboration are the two that, that I really step up. But um, resilience is also in there, and you'll see that referenced in a few slides. So what do you mean here we don't have the skills we need? 80% say they don't have, what? What's going on, Travis? Yeah, so this is kind of funny. When our company degree got started, our founders really started out asking this, asking the question why, right? If we've got everything we need, why do we still not have the skills we need? So the left-hand side, you'll see infinite learning opportunities, all of these different technologies that are out there, um, sophisticated HR technologies, our human capital management systems and everything. If all of these tools are in our organizations, why did Gardner find that only 20% of employees have the skills needed for both their current role and their future career? So that means 80% don't, right? Um, and I think this really, I would imagine at least that a lot of our leaders that were suddenly thrust into a virtual leadership role, they've probably struggled with a lot, a lot of this too, either not having the right access or perspective to the tools they have, or um, just feeling the frustration of being thrust into that role um, and, and struggling. Quite honestly, next slide, Doug. So we'll we'll keep with the eighty percent theme. Um, when uh, I believe this study was done by Price Waterhouse Coopers PwC, they they do their annual CEO study, and the study last year was pretty similar to the one the year year before, and probably the one this year was that they feel like eighty percent of their um, they lack the skills to have you know that that presents a serious threat to their growth. And you'll see some examples on the right-hand side of your screen. Um, the first is General Motors. They're looking at, you know, the, the shift to electric and autonomous vehicles and not having the skills. Um, and they've got a, a massive plan now, and they've restructured to be able to meet those needs and really go in and figure out 
what skills are needed, what they need to upskill, what skills maybe they need to recruit in. Um, Kraft Heinz, this isn't funny, but it, but it kind of is funny. That they're looking for the skills to excite customers about healthier food options. And I was sharing this story with Doug. Over the last three years, they've lost $229 million in sales. And their number one product release that they put the most money behind and they thought it was going to be a huge hit was this crazy product called Mayo Chup. Can any guess as what Mayo Chup is? It's literally half mayonnaise, half ketchup, and they combined it into a product. And they were hitting a lot of their hopes that that was going to be massive sales. And it just wasn't. Um, so, you know, they're certainly looking for the skills to excite customers and be more, you know, really those skills focus around uh, innovation and leadership. And then last but not least, SAP, looking at the Internet of Things, they, they've had massive, massive restructuring costs associated with, you know, just these missed opportunities to really seize on this idea that everything's connected. Your refrigerator, your front doorbell, everything is connected to the Internet these days, your garage door opener. Um, so they're looking at ways to, um, to, to affect that positively. So go ahead and go to the next slide, Doug. And I've never met a CEO who disagrees. <clears throat> they all struggle with this one. And you can go ahead and punch enter a couple of times. It looks like there's a couple, I, I forgot there was an animation here, but um, the key takeaway here is all of those companies that we just talked about, they all have those sophisticated systems that we opened up with, all of the great learning technologies and HCM systems and all of that. But they, and they even saw the change coming, right? They saw the internet of things and the autonomous vehicles and they, they saw where it was coming and they still failed at the, to, to meet that change. So these, these aren't bad companies. They're still, they've got great cultures. They've had people that have grown and evolved, but they're really missing that, um, that systematic way to look at future and, and opportunities. And this study actually came from, um, sorry, Doug, I had, I had my footnotes on here and I don't, I'm trying to remember. I'll have to look it up, look it up. I think this was Brandon Hall. And they found that companies that quantify the gap between the skills they need for future opportunities um, and those that they currently have are nearly twice as likely to succeed in this whole idea of digital transformation. And I would imagine the same is true for our leadership teams that are virtual now. They're, they're looking, um, if they're thinking future, no one could have predicted a global pandemic. But if they're thinking through, you know, what if things were to shift and change rapidly, what skills are they mo most going to need to propel the company forward? That, then the virtual leadership teams would definitely be affected by that. I think we all are, yeah. So we talked about the first um, aspect of leadership competencies, which is how to assess what they are. By analogy, when you go to the doctor, you get your vitals taken. When you work with a business psychologist, you can assess the competencies that may or may not exist. So in Brenda's organization, integrity and honesty and such are very important to her. Accountability over time and taking initiative is important to her. I think most of us could come up with a, a spider web image like this. And my experience is that some of you, uh, this is not familiar. So let me explain it a little bit. Let's imagine you figure out eight competencies, things you wanna look at. So you wanna look at digital technology influence or an experimentation mindset, which just means I'm gonna give it a go the strength of your culture, IQ is smart, but it's, it's more important than uh, emotional quotient. Engagement is important, influence-based leadership development. Agility is a key thing. There's that word agility again. And let's imagine that you make a map. This gray indicates a cultural profile for organizations that struggle right here to make data-driven decisions. But the orange, is a snowflake or a spider web that is a cultural profile for organizations with daddy savvy leaders. So if you uh, are hiring, and, and Brenda, I'm not sure if you were, or Jennifer, but you'd seek somebody in this culture, in this company, who has digital technology expertise and is, uh, has a growth mindset. They have an experimentation mindset because they'll be a better fit in that organization, right? Where's my cursor? Boom, off the screen, <laughs> which leads to 16% of organizations. What? Yeah, so this is actually the Brandon Hall Group uh, study. The last McKinsey Group was the one that had the last statistic that I shared, but uh, I, I had to look that up because it was going to bug me. But yeah, only 16% of organizations link people's skills to goals. And research shows that most workers, they lack these key things to really be able to navigate all of this rapid change themselves. 
So when we look at it, things that are really important that, that should be thought about are guidance, you know, on the skills that they should and could be developing to grow their careers, the resources to develop on their own and with each other through their day-to-day -day work. So we, we, we talk about this as learning in the flow of work, that we're all learning each and every day. Um, it's what resources do we need to connect to our workers in order to enable that, and especially our leaders that are thrust into these uh, virtual um, roles insights to quantify their skills and gaps and build those good habits and visualize the progress as they go, which leads to opportunities to advance their skills and their careers through projects or jobs that may match these specific interests. And, you know, while 16%, this sounds like gloom and doom, there's, there's hope for sure, right? Like when we think about virtual teams and, and what we've had to do on the fly, things like Doug talked about earlier, adaptability, flexibility, the resilience, um, I like to talk about grace. I mean, you know, in the, in, I was talking to a friend the other day and he said, you would have never, you would have like shrunk under your desk if your kid had come into your room during a webinar or your dog had barked and all of these things happened because of the expectations. Things have shifted. I mean, we're all sort of learning as we go, but I, I think the human element has really saved the day on all of this in terms of the, the skills needed to, uh, to propel these people in virtual environments. I agree. So let me throw one at you that most people in this call have never heard of before. Travis, if I asked you, um, are you wealthy? You'd probably respond with uh, financial capital or human capital, how many people you know, or social cap, uh, or, or some, what you know. Um, what about psychological capital, psychap? What if I told you that this is something a bunch of nerds know about that nobody else knows about? and it explains some 65% of job satisfaction and over 70% of organizational commitment. Would you want to learn anything about this? Like, Absolutely, and this was a late app for everyone on the call, so I'm learning with you all, and I, I really found this extremely intriguing, so share. So let's imagine that there are four competencies that have a second order effect. In other words, they work better together than they do by themselves. So hope and efficacy is stronger than hope by itself or efficacy by itself. And that's measured in a thing called a correlation coefficient. So 0.789 is the impact of hope. But if you have four of these things together, they have a second order effect. So let me define each of these. This is the HERO model, H-E-R-O, and I think it works really well in the pandemic and with virtual teams. Hope is defined as the will and the way that will find a vaccine that's validated by the CDC. Efficacy is a nerdy word, but it just means your capacity to do your job. And resilience is your ability to rebound to a previous level after a, a loss of some sort, to a previous level or above. And optimism is a choice. It's a generalized positive affect in contrast to negativism or pessimism. So hope, efficacy, resiliency, and optimism work together to define or describe a thing called psychological capital. And this is dynamic. It's infinite. It's, I think, something we do a better job of teaching in our families and our churches than we do in our workplaces. But that's my bias. PSYCAP is dynamic. People can learn it in 90 minutes or less. And I think it will redefine the workforce. How's that for a teaser? Oh, here are my numbers. Very nice. When I think about applying, We've got the, the first two buckets. Here's the third bucket, applying this information to your team. We've talked about how do you assess, and then how do you create competencies within your team. The third aspect is how do you apply it to your team? So here's some, there's lots of examples of these, but here's an, another example from DDI. If we were to look at leader assessment of effectiveness in, in three competencies, one might be digital literacy, your capacity to read digital information or use digital information. This varies by age cohorts. So millennials, as you might expect, are better at digital literacy, but they're not that much better than baby boomers, 0.3%. Leading with digitization is a, is a thing. The idea is that we'll have the data inform our decision-making. Physicians do a tremendous job of this with telehealth. We've seen that uh, in the last six months. But what about, um, I don't know, your local city or town? Are they really leading with digitization to tell you where the potholes are, or where the traffic jams are, or, or where the next social protest could be? Not so much. Uh, we can use it. We can track Twitter and we can track social media uh, to inform us, but we're not using it really well. The third example is leading with virtual teams. And the point I love here is who's better? 
the millennials are not as strong at leading virtual teams as the boomers, which I think is, is remarkable. You could argue that they're probably in positions of managerial responsibility. They could be older, they could have gray hair, <laughs> but they're the ones in charge, but they're doing it and they're, they're learning quickly. So there's kind of two directions I wanna go in here. If I were to ask, what could you possibly do that would have at least a 400% return on investment? Let's imagine, Travis, if agreed that you've, you've got uh, a, a newly promoted manager and you want that person to excel at their job and you want at least a 400% return on investment and you'll put in 20 or 30K to teach that person some of those skills. That's called executive coaching. And this study comes from Coach Source, which is the largest global provider of executive coaching. I'm a, an engagement manager with this world. And the, the common question is, what's the purpose? It's not leadership development. Always. It's not always transition to a new job. It's a thing called executive presence, which is how do you present yourself digitally? My experience is that I've got clients in the last six months who have done a tremendous job of taking the behavioral feedback from a screen and accelerating their executive presence. And if you ask organizational members and that leader themselves, and if you ask internal coaches and contrast that with external coaches, you'll see some of these percentages. We don't invest in coaching to fix people or give them career advice. And we certainly don't invest in life coaching because there's a low ROI. But when you think about these top three, leadership development, transitioning to a new job, developing executive presence, tremendous ROI. Here's one more slide, and I think it's the last one, to kind of scare people. Uh, ISO stands for the International Standards of Operations, and 3414 is a number of a new ISO decision. So think of I ISO as the standards that define clean water and financial trades and safety of your car. These are global standards, and now there's one in human capital, human capital reporting. This is gonna affect all of us. So I, I put in this slide that the need is initiated already. It's initiated in, in Germany because they're obliged to abide by it, which means that US publicly traded companies are gonna be required to report human capital metrics. And that means that this standard will become the emerging human capital reporting standard. Well, what does that mean for your company? If you are a public company and you've got the capability to report some of these 11 human capital reporting standards, but not all of them, you're gonna be forced to report them soon. That's if you're a publicly traded company. Why? Because investors need to have confidence in those leadership uh, capabilities. If you're a private company, the second bullet, you probably lack the awareness and reporting capabilities, so you don't really know what you should be reporting on. I think that means that in order to prepare for uh, and, and lead mark the market and prepare for some kind of acquisition in the future, if that's the goal of your company, you need to be mindful of this standard because it's going to shape the future. This is another example, kind of like SciCap, of something where the nerds know something that practitioners and business leaders don't know yet, and it's going to shape all of us. Comments or questions? Because we're going to open this up, and if you're muted, we encourage you to say something. Alan and Kay Doss and anybody else? Yeah, please, please speak up and, and any feedback that you can provide on the format, on the content, we would greatly appreciate. Um, we actually, uh, thank you for joining. We had a huge list of people that didn't show up during this time, but a lot of people signed up because we will be uh, sharing this recording back with you all. So um, know, know that you'll be getting an email with that in the next day, within the next day as well. Thank you. I, I think this was uh, helpful. Um, can I also did not receive the other two recordings. Um, were they available as well? They are, and I can send it to you. Wonderful, thank you so much. But thank you for this. That was very interesting, and, and thank you for letting us know about the reporting coming down the pike. Yeah, you bet. So. Yeah, send me an email on that, KDOS. I don't know your name. <laughs> okay, it's Kelly, sorry. <laughs> Kelly. Send me an email on that, and I'll be happy to send you a bunch of information. I think it's going to... Uh, affect thousands of us. Yeah, thank you so much. <laughs> you bet. <laughs> Alan, Jennifer, Brenda, any comments? So I gathered with those four 
steps, the hope and uh, was the efficacy and all of that, that your attitude towards your job is the most important thing. It's going to determine the outcome there. I think you're right, Brenda. Attitude is mm -hmm. critically important and dynamic. Think about somebody who's struggling because they have low engagement, their attitude is, is pessimistic. Um, that person can choose to be optimistic. There's a lot of research on this. It's fascinating to me. Yeah, yeah. I like the fact that the baby boomers were at the top of actually doing it. Here we are. Come on, <laughs> sister. <laughs> we're talking about our gray hair. Isn't that encouraging? <laughs> yeah, it is. It is. Yeah, you're a virtual leader, and you said that in the last week um, you've carried on practicing your virtual leadership tactics. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think I know the answer to Alan's Close it to you anyways, Doug. Um, he said, love the hero model. Um, is this your own research? No, um, it's too big. Uh, Fred Luthens <laughs> at, uh, at Nebraska is probably the best voice of it, L-U-T-H-A-N-S. But I, I love it because it's dynamic, it's coachable, it's trainable, and psychological capital is something I used in my dissertation uh, to globally validate a, a, a process that we shared in the last, uh, the last little seminar. So, Alan, I don't know if that answered your question. Is he muted? Um, he is muted. It says, um, would love to discuss more in depth on that model and how we can measure PSYCAP as part of our leadership com competency model in the future. And he said, uh, he apologizes, he's in a loud environment. That's fine. Um, let me give you another reference. Um, the, the book, the, there's a bunch of books, but um, a lot of them are nerdy. They're really kind of hard to read. So I took some of that and I put it in this book um, that I wrote last November, uh, Objectives and Key Results. And there's many examples of how I've used that PSYCAP data uh, with small companies and larger companies. And frankly, it's as simple as asking 12 questions about hope, efficacy, resilience, and optimism and seeing how they change over time because it's dynamic. Um, all of us are aware of, of the fear-based responses that we've had to the pandemic but you probably also know somebody who's doing well, who's thriving, don't you? And I suspect they're higher on PSYCAP, they're higher on hope, they're more able to do their job. Brenda, you're nodding like you know that person. Resilience, it's you? <laughs> Me, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, my, my PSYCAP is high. That's perfect. Mm -hmm. And it's dynamic. So it might have been as high 20 years ago or lower and you and increase over time. I think it's, yes. it's fascinating. Yeah. So for you, has it always been pretty high, you think? It's always been pretty high, but uh, it's, it's higher in this season. Like I work from home. I've been in the house since March. I live alone. Yeah. Uh, I'm not lonely. Right. I'm busy and I feel like I can do it until the end. You look like you can, <laughs> energetically, right? Mm -hmm. um, that's fascinating. I love, I love it. Mm -hmm. You know, this I don't have, to, I don't have to deal with you know young children and having to try to teach them. I don't have the hassles that other people have, but at the same time, they don't have to live by themselves, which might be a hassle. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. I think. Um, a lot of folks have responded to the pandemic by shutting down and um, social isolation is the wrong term, isn't it? It's physical mm -hmm. isolation. But it's physical isolation. Yes. You could be socially more connected to others than, than ever. Yeah. Um, and, and some people are, so you might be Brenda and you're getting the validation from all those other people. As an example, my mom's 80th birthday is coming up uh, on Friday. So I'm hosting a call with people who would not normally be invited to Minnesota to come to her wedding <laughs> to her, you know, 80th. And, and they're taking part. It's delightful. So I think we're more phys physically distant than ever, but maybe more socially connected. And that does good things for our hearts. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. What else? Anybody comments? I'm adding to the chat for um, Alan's benefit.
that Fred Luthens has done a lot of research on SciCat. So if you're academically inclined, I misspelled Fred, but F-R-E-D, <laughs> there's an academic resource. So the whole point of this um, short mini webinar series for us is to provoke you a bit, tease you a bit, and invite you to become more confident virtual leaders. Uh, we're not going backwards. As a species, we're not going backwards. As virtual workers, we're not going backwards. And when I think about what's ahead, I suspect that all of us will become even more savvy as virtual leaders in the future. So thank you for participating. We'll send you the recordings. If we can help in any way, you've got our contact info. Glad to be a resource. Travis? That's all I've got. Thanks, Doug. Thanks, everyone. Have a great afternoon. All right. Thank you. Thank you.